Hey guys, welcome back to Bible Unplugged. I'm Wave Nunley, and we're at the very end of a series of videos on the giving of thanks. And you know, it doesn't make any difference whether you're watching this video or the other three in this series, whether it is Thanksgiving time or it's some other part of the year, it's always appropriate to give thanks. I was driving down the road the other day and saw a marquee on a church and it said, Thanksgiving is not a day, it should be an attitude. And that's exactly what we're looking at. That's exactly what comes out of the book of Psalms. So that's what we have focused on in this four-part series, is giving thanks through the book of Psalms. In the first ses session, we did a little bit of Psalm 119 and all of Psalm 116. In the second session, we did Psalm 100. The last session we did, we did Psalm 105, and today we're going to conclude this series with a consideration of Psalm 95. So let's jump right into the psalm. What should we do? The psalmist doesn't leave us hanging. He immediately jumps in and he gives an, the, an imperative, the voice of command. Lehu, come and let us sing for joy to Yahweh. And I've put this in poetically parallel position. So let us sing and let us shout for joy and to Yahweh and to the rock of our salvation. You see how one kind of defines, describes, or amplifies the other. Beautiful Hebrew poetic parallelism that flows throughout this psalm. Let us come before his presence with todah. There's that word that we started all the way back at the beginning of this series, todah, thanks thankfulness, thanksgiving, sometimes even a thank offering. So the word todah, come before his presence with todah and shout joyfully to him. Notice before his presence and to him, these are poetically parallel with and with thanksgiving and psalms. So notice this is a beautiful way that the Bible self-interprets it. It, it. Scripture interpret scripture. The Bible it kind of lays its own intended meaning out. Thanksgiving, the word is todah. Now, does that mean the, the animal sacrifice that is a todah offering, or does it mean a sacrifice of praise? The second part of this verse comes along and clarifies what this is. The author intends us to understand this thanksgiving, not as a thanksgiving offering on the altar, a meat offering, but rather a thanksgiving of the lips, of the giving of praise that reflects an attitude that says this, I'm not the sinner and I'm not my own source. I'm not the king of my own universe. God is king and he's the one who is the provider. And so it's just a great way of humbling oneself and giving thanks back to the source of blessing in your life. Why should we give thanks? because Yahweh is a great God. He is a great king and he's above all the other gods of the earth, all the other gods of various nations surrounding Israel that are truly not div divinities or deities. They're really not separate independent gods. They are actually figments of the imagination of the, the worshiper of those idols or false gods but a great king and he's above everything. He rules over human beings, over angels, over nature. He, he rules even over this you know, uh, area of the negative supernatural uh, out there that's in the world. He's still king over them as well. Now, watch how the Lord is a great God is amplified. In whose hands are the depths of the earth? and the peaks of the mountains. Now what I've done is I've put in yellow in these brackets here what is called a merism. It, it's uh, the uh, expression of the opposite ends of a thing. The depths, the deepest parts of the earth, that's seven miles below the earth's uh, below the, the surface of the water in the northern Marianas Trench. And then uh, there is also the peaks of the mountains. So if you're talking about the lowest part of the earth and the highest part of the earth, it basically means he, it belo all belongs to him. By right of creation, this whole world is his. He's a great king and he's the one who made everything. That's the way a merism works. You express the opposite ends of a thing, and then that means the entirety of the thing. He does it again in verse 5. 
The sea is his and the dry land. And I put that in yellow as well. That's yet another merism. So the depths and the peaks, the sea and the dry land, it's all his and he, because he's the one who's made it all. Let's just drill down on this merism thing. It comes from the Latin merismus, the technical term, and it just is a way of shorthand way of saying when you express the opposite ends of a thing, you mean all of it. Everything in the middle, from the beginning to the end, from the top to the bottom. For example, light and darkness. God made light and darkness. That means he's the God of time and he made it all. Good and evil. The, the man will know both good and evil. Basically, that's a biblical way. It's a merismatic way of saying they'll know everything. They'll have all knowledge if the man and the woman eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it, the knowledge of everything. That's reserved for God alone. So from the greatest of them to the least of them, we hear this in the book of Jonah, that the people in Nineveh, when Jonah preached, the, the Spirit convicted the people and the people all repented. They put on sackcloth and ashes from the greatest of them to the least of these. It means the entire city of Nineveh. In the book of Ezekiel, he says that God is going to send a fire among the trees. It's a, it's a symbol of judgment. And, and the, it, that fire is going, to just, is going to consume the dry trees, but it's going to consume the green trees as well. In other words, this judgment is going to be all comprehensive. It's going to touch every area of society and of humanity. In the book of Malachi that concludes the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, at least in the order that we have it in our English Bibles, it says that he is going to send judgment that will destroy both root and branch. Hear it again, it's, it's kind of like the peaks of the mountains and the depths of the sea. It's the root is the bottom and the branch is the very top. It's going to consume the entire tree. That's the way that merism works. And I hope that this Psalm 95 has helped you so that you are able to better understand when you're reading your Bible and you see, wow, that, what, that, this is interesting. I've got the opposite ends of a thing. It means the entirety of it. And that's uh, the, um, the, the principle, the literary device of merism. So we've gone to the why should we worship, but now we go back again to what should we do? How should we respond to this great God who made everything, to whom everything belongs, and is such an, um, uh, an amazing, incredible ruler over all kings and all false gods? So in verse 6, he comes back to this, O oh, come, let us. And earlier it was lehu. This is bo'u. It's come on now. Hey, everybody, get in, 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 get involved in this. Let us worship and bow down. So the, the, the expressions earlier it was sing and shout with joy. Now it's this kind of more worshipful, more venerating, uh, maybe more reflective. But let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And this is kind of it is all inclusive of that process of you kneel down on your knees, then you bow over with your face to the, to the dirt. That's in the Bible all the way back to Genesis, and it's even before the Bible in earlier literature that predates Moses' writings. And so worship, bow down, and uh, the worship here is prostration, is the word is to prostrate yourself, and to bow down and kneel. So it's just a beautiful picture of ancient um, Near Eastern worship practices that are incorporated into Israelite worship and find it themselves then enshrined in the Bible. Before the Lord our Maker. So God is not just the maker of the depths and, and, uh, the, uh, and the peaks of the mountains and that kind of thing. He's also our maker as well. So we're part of this creation. We have the responsibility then to respond to Him this good God, this powerful, creative God, in a way that is appropriate to His standing, to His stature. He is a great God. He is above all the kings and all of the other fake gods of the world. He is also a good God, and He deserves our thanksgiving, our worship. Why is that? So He keeps going back and forth between what is it that God is, and then, and, and why should we worship Him, and then what should we do? He's going back and forth. So, in the why, because He is our God. He's not just a great God above all the kings and above all the, um, uh, the, the false gods. He's also our God. He rules over us. 
You know, if we're in right relationship with him, if we're submitted to the rule of the great king, he's our God. We belong to him. Watch this. We belong to him. We're the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So this, just in this one passage, what the, what the psalmist is doing is uh, he belongs to us and we belong to him. What an awesome way of referring to this connected nature of this relationship, the kind of, you know, going both ways. It's not just all God. It's not just all us. It's we're in this together. God is inviting. The psalmist is uh, reflecting this. God is constantly inviting his natural order, including human beings, to be in right relationship with him, to be in in proper order. So that we're the people of his pasture and we are the sheep of his hand. Wow, what an incredible and and impacting uh, reality, way to express this relationship between us and God. He's ours and we're his. Boy, that's awesome. Song of Songs. I'm my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. Same kind of intimate sort of um, relationship expressed here in this psalm. Now, when we get to the very end of this psalm, uh, it's, it's been very super positive up until this point. Um, come before his presence, um, sing joyfully, um, let us worship and bow down. God is great. Look at the awesome nature that he has created. And we're part of that. We belong to him. He belongs to us. And then in verse 7 through the end of the psalm, there's, there's a change in, in attitude Instead of this encouragement, this beckoning people into this worshipful mode of thanksgiving, now the author gives a stern warning. This psalm ends as positively as it started with a very stern warning at the end. Read it with me. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah. It's the... the, the, the um, contentious situation that Israel experienced during their wanderings in the wilderness, uh, book of Exodus, Numbers, etc. Or in the day of Massa in the wilderness. Don't harden your hearts like this earlier generation did. When your fathers tested me, they tried me. Notice the poetic parallelism. Your fathers tested me. Fathers and they tested, tried me though they had seen my work. So when you see what God does, the response is not to harden your heart, but rather to open your heart. With what? With this this overflow of thanksgiving for the goodness of God, for our relationship with Him. He's our God and we are the people of His pasture. Um, And this goodness that He pours out, this bounty that He pours out on us as His people. So... The, uh, Psalm 95 then concludes with this warning of don't respond negatively the way that they did. Make sure that your resp- response is appropriate to his investment in our lives. And verse 10, for 40 years I loathed that generation. I said, there are people who err in their heart. It's not just what they did. It's not just about base touching. There was a heart problem. They had a heart issue, and it was expressed then in their rebellious attitude, their unwillingness to submit to the rule of this great king. They didn't know my ways. They didn't walk like I walked. It was hard to keep that up, that relationship, that um, he is our God and we are the sheep of his pasture because they're not walking in God's ways. Can two walk together unless they make an appointment, says the prophet Amos. So they're unable to to maintain that close, intimate uh, relationship with their God because they're not reflecting His nature, not walking in His ways, not properly responsive to His call. Therefore, I swore in my anger, they shall not enter into my rest. And that's where Psalm 95 ends. Is this kind of a downer? 
it, that it starts so great and then it, it, it ends with this stern rebuke? Is, is that out of touch with the nature of God? Or, oh, well, you know, in the, in the New Testament, we know that things are you know, compassion and mercy and patience and forgiveness and all that great stuff. But look at what happens when Jesus tells a story. He's telling it in parable form. And he's talking about this same kind of situation where God beckons us because of what he has done t- to, uh, for us and, and the kind of God that he is. And then there's this unresponsiveness on the part of fallen man. Watch what Jesus does. In this parable, he's, uh, there was a certain man who was giving a big dinner, a great big old banquet, and he invited many. But... A lot of people who were invited didn't respond appropriately. They didn't want to come. They didn't want to acknowledge his gracious gift of this big banquet. And they all alike began to make excuses. I've just thrown all of this up on the board real quick because so many of you know this parable already. I'm just saying that this is the same kind of stern rebuke in Jesus' teaching in in parable form that we get in Psalm 95. The man invited a lot of people, but they all started making excuses and they wouldn't come. They wouldn't respond appropriately to this gracious invitation. And so then what Jesus says about this is none of those people that were invited are going to taste of my dinner. They end up rejected, not because they weren't invited. They were invited, but because they didn't respond appropriately to that invitation. So this is not just a matter of, oh, well, the writer of Psalm 95 started out great, but then he got back into this, you know, stern, vindictive, wrathful, vengeful sort of God sort of thing and ended up in this stern rebuke at the end of, the, of Psalm 95. No, it's, this is a, an appropriate exhortation or um, uh, warning, if you will, that, uh, that is appropriate after such a gracious invitation. Let's come before Him. Let's offer up our thanksgiving. Why? He's a great God. He's done all of this stuff. He's our God. We've got this personal relationship that He's graciously brought us into. Our response, appropriate response, is an attitude of todah, of thanksgiving. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, toward the end of the New Testament, After quoting Psalm 95 in chapter 3, and now we're in chapter 4, he's quoting it again. And as he begins to interpret and apply this psalm to the life of people that he's writing to, he says, and he gives us, us, after he's quoted Psalm uh, 95, then he gives, as Jesus does in this parable, and it's directly connected to Psalm 95, is Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. He gives us this stern warning. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through because of disobedience. Just this uh, inability to respond with the appropriate gratitude, thanksgiving, thankfulness, appreciativeness of this God who so deserves it. He is God. He's God above all the earth. He's God above all other gods. And he's, He is our maker. He's our maker. Were it not for Him, we wouldn't be here. Were it not for Him, our lives would not be stained, uh, sustained as they are. Therefore, as we've seen in all of these psalms in this uh, particular series, and now at the end in Psalm 95, it is only appropriate that with that kind of situation, that you and I recognize we are not our own source. We're not the center of our universe. He's the source. He's the center. And to Him, He deserves all of the glory, all of the praise, all of the todah, the thanksgiving, um, the giving of thanks. So I think that that marquee that I saw on that, uh, at that church last week is absolutely appropriate. It, it's, it's a reminder that this matter of thanksgiving, it's not just a time of year. It's not just a specific day. 
For us, it ought to be an attitude 24-7, 365 because of this great God and the great things that He has done in our lives. I'm trusting that this brief er um, discussion of Psalm 95 is going to bring blessing into your life, is going to equip you, and like the psalm does, and like the parable does, and like this interpretation of Psalm 95 in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, I hope that it challenges you to give the thanks to God that is appropriate to His great name. God bless you. Serve Him with thanksgiving in the coming week. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch our videos. If you're benefiting from the content that you're receiving from them, please make sure that you're following us on Facebook and that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so you never miss a thing. While you're at it, share our content with your friends and family. Encourage them to follow us as well. Thanks for helping us to reach as many as we can with a powerful message of God's Word in its original context.